Welcome to our event here today. I'm absolutely delighted um, to be here today with you as part of the EU Employment and Social Rights Forum. Um, we will be talking today about Ukraine, about the central importance of human capital in Ukraine, uh, in particular in the context, of course, also of the digital um, transformation. The resilience of Ukraine's human capital is increasingly important, um, particularly in relation to the country's ability to educate and retain skilled workers, deploy these in the most effective ways, um, but also focus on high growth industries in these very difficult times. But there are many questions in terms of how, how can we do this? What is needed to equip people with the right kind of skills? Where are the skills gaps? What are the kind of investments that are needed? What can the private sector do? And very importantly, also, what are the policy solutions that are needed? And then, what can we all do as partners, the European Commission, the EBRD, uh, many other partners as well, the European Training Foundation, of course. So today uh, we have a very exciting uh, program here um, that consists of three parts. We start with a fireside chat. We then move to the signing of an MOU between the European uh, Training Foundation and the EBRD. And then we also have a, a panel of technical experts. If you as participants have any questions that you would like to ask, please use the slider function. And we will, in a moment, show um, the, the QR code that you can use to do that. And you can ask questions, and we, at the end of each conversation, we will come to those questions and respond to those. But without further ado, let me introduce our very, very impressive um, panel of fireside chat speakers. Um, first of all, of course, Commissioner Nicholas Schmidt, uh, European Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights. Thank you very much uh, for coming. We also online have um, Irina Postolovska, who's the Deputy Minister for Social Policy for European Integration in Ukraine. I hope we can see her uh, in a moment as well. Well, I'm sure she will be coming up on screen. And then, uh, of course, uh, Mark Bowman, who's the Vice President for Policy and Partnerships at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Maybe, Commissioner Schmidt, I start with you. Um, of course, building Ukraine uh, building Ukraine's human capital, particularly in the digital world or in the digital context, is hugely important. Um, it's one of the key elements to, to help its war effort, but also longer term. But of course, also, um, the EU has a very important role to play when we look at the longer term reconstruction of U Ukraine, and particularly also with a view of pre-accession. Where do you see the, the role of the EU in this context in particular? <clears throat> so... First, uh, thank you very much for bringing us together. And uh, I'm very happy also to, uh, to be together with the uh, EBRD, who is an important part of for the European Union and the Commission particularly, and also plays and has played a long lasting role, by the way, in, uh, in Ukraine, but in, uh, in many other countries. So thank you very much for that. Uh, it is obvious that the uh, support we have to give to Ukraine is an essential support because it is a support precisely uh, in a context where we have to show that the European Union has the capacity to help a country which has been attacked, uh, which has been aggressed, and uh, which is, or at least the intention is there to be destroyed. And I think this is a very, very important element. And that's why also our support has to be continuous. Our support has to be bold. And uh, the commitment has to be clear and steady. So all discussions uh, about, well, how is for the time being not useful. Because what we have to do is really express our full support mm -hmm. to Ukraine, also financial support because it's different aspects, but everything goes together. First, the military aspect, we will not discuss here, but I have to say it, essential, mm -hmm. and it's not about deciding or discussing how we have to uh, organize, it's just give the, the much, uh, the, as much military support to Ukraine as we can, because this is decisive. There isn't, for the moment, no other perspective. And the second one is to help Ukraine to survive more or less economically. That's a challenge because you can imagine a country 
in this kind of war, where finally infrastructures are destroyed, where also a lot of people have left for security reasons to the European Union, and here also the European Union has played a very, and is playing a very important role in terms of receiving many women, majority of women, many children. We have to, to provide all the support to these people in terms of education for the, for the kids, but also in terms of jobs for the women. With always the idea that these people will, most of them, go back once the situation has improved. And uh, I think this is, the third one is the uh, very courageous, I must say, and this is, uh, I, I must say, the, uh, the decision very much also inspired by the president of the commission to be bold on uh, the enlargement. So Ukraine being, having now the statute of a candidate country and uh, starting the negotiation with Ukraine. And here I must say that it is admirable what a country in war, mobilizing many people on the front, on the front line, is able to manage the reforms they are doing. So certainly, they have come a long way. And there is still a way to go. But what has been achieved uh, in Ukraine in this period uh, is remarkable. And this is the issue. We have now to accompany Ukraine on the next steps. And this means also, by the way, and I insist very much to help Ukraine to keep its economy uh, afloat. And this is, as I said, not easy because elect and energy infrastructures are destroyed. This is the whole plan to finally destroy the economic infrastructure of this country. And uh, so the, the, the EU has, together with other partners, to, to help Ukraine to maintain the economic activity. Now, I think, uh, I must say, I'm not a Ukraine specialist, but what I've heard and what I've seen is that this country, in terms of digital, in some way can, I would say, compare favorably with EU, with EU and with EU countries. So the uh, development of digital uh, has been quite in advance. And this is an asset for this country, obviously, especially also in war times. And we are not speaking about the military use, that's, that's essential, but also the to build the economy, there have been companies, Ukrainian companies, going uh, in EU member states, operating from there, thanks to the very strong uh, capacities in digital, including also artificial intelligence. And I think in that way also, Ukraine will be an important partner in, for Europe, or the European Union as a future member of the European Union in terms of uh, developing our capacities uh, in digital and especially in artificial intelligence. So we, we have to support this. This is due, by the way, to an education system. There are a lot of young Ukrainians very well trained in digital. And uh, this is an asset also in these special times. And it is an asset also for Europe. So I think in this particular perspective, Ukraine is already an important partner. Thank you very much. And I think this, this very, very clear and strong message on unwavering support and working with Ukraine across all the aspects um, that are required, including human capital, is really, really important. Deputy Minister um, um, Postolovska, very good to see you now on the screen. Welcome. Um, You've just heard Commissioner Schmidt and, and, and setting out the, 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 the commitment, really, of the European Commission to keep working with Ukraine, to keep supporting the country across a, a whole range of areas, but particularly also with a focus on human capital in this digital world now. Um, and actually, you know, paying a lot of compliments on, on 
um, where Ukraine already is in this context and, and that a very good building base. But where do you see the key priorities uh, also for your ministry uh, in terms of cooperating with the Commission, but also really um, pulling this forward for your country? Thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this fireside chat. And it's... Can you hear me? No, we cannot hear you at this stage. <laughs> Is it working now? Yes, now we can. Yes. Very good. Okay. Yeah, Wonderful. Well. Excellent. Despite the technical checks, we still have technical difficulties, but that's life. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this fireside chat. It is really a pleasure to join you, you today to talk about what perhaps in my view is the most important topic, mm -hmm. that of investing in people. And before I highlight some of the key priorities uh, in this regard, particularly for the Ministry of Social Policy, I'd also of course like to thank our European partners for the unwavering support and the strong uh, words of support from uh, Commissioner Schmidt as well. Without strengthening human capital, uh, it is on our understanding that we will not be able to achieve sustained inclusive economic growth and will not have a workforce prepared for the more highly skilled jobs of the future. The foundations for Ukraine's recovery and future are closely linked to the support of an investment in our people. The Russian Federation's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, unfortunately, has taken an immense toll on human lives and human capital in our country. The internal displacement and forced migration across borders has further exacerbated an already challenging demographic outlook for Ukraine. It is thus our responsibility to create conditions for individuals to live in and return to Ukraine when it is safe to do so. This includes ensuring access to quality health, education, and social services, as well as, of course, access to jobs to ensure that every citizen is able to achieve their full potential. Our goal as the Ministry of Social Policy is to support individuals across the different life stages, to enable them to actively participate in the labor force and to provide decent living conditions and opportunities for social integration for individuals requiring care. To address the increasing poverty rate, we are continuing to provide support to those most in need and reformatting the state social assistance programs to low income citizens to ensure financial protection. In addition, we are introducing a more targeted cash assistance program with stimuli to return to the labor force, complemented with a strong care component. All this coupled as Commissioner Schmidt said on the focus on digitalization, digitizing services and payments for greater convenience, efficiency and accountability, while at the same time ensuring inclusivity. To stimulate the development of social services, we are working on reforming and introducing new ways of financing and delivering social services through the establishment of a purchasing agency and engagement of public and private providers in the delivery of social services. And perhaps I'd just like to highlight a few key initiatives in this regard in terms of the new social services that we are currently piloting. The first is the social service of resilience or that of psychosocial support that will be provided at the community level. As you are aware, the needs in mental health support are wide and universal across Ukraine. More than 70% of the population reports feeling stress or anxiety. And according to WHO estimates, up to 10 million of people are at risk of mental health problems. Under the All Ukrainian Mental Health Program initiated by the First Lady of Ukraine, the Ministry of Social Policy is piloting a new service to provide individuals in the community with psychosocial support through group and individual counseling, as well as family support services. In addition, this program will include training for first line responders and volunteers to strengthen the resilience of communities to respond during emergency situations. In addition, we are piloting new social services for veterans and their families designed to improve social adaptation and integration in order to in, uh, support individuals in their return to civilian life. The third aspect I'd like to focus on is on inclusive recovery. 
And for us, it is essential to ensure the necessary support for individuals with disabilities. Unfortunately, as a result of the war, the number of individuals with disabilities has increased significantly. The government of Ukraine is implementing a comprehensive disability reform to apply the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health, the ICF, for the assessment of a person's needs and provision of corresponding rehabilitation and social services. And of course, the provision of prosthetics and assistive devices are key elements of this rehabilitation process. It is also critical for us to ensure that individuals with disabilities can actively participate in the labor market. To this end, we are also providing new social services to support individuals during the employment process, and as well as introducing legislation to encourage and provide incentives to employers to employ individuals with disabilities. This also includes reimbursement for reasonable workplace accommodation measures. And perhaps I'd like to end with one of the key reform priorities that we are also implementing is one that is in line with the EU accession priorities. And that is of implementing a reform package that decreases reliance on institutional care for children, individuals with disabilities and older persons. With the support of the EU, we have already established a coordination center for family upbringing and child care development that will also spearhead the development of the deinstitutionalization reform for children to ensure that all children are able to uh, grow up in inclusive and protective communities in family-based settings. These reform priorities are also currently being reflected in the Ukraine plan of the Ukraine facility, and we would be happy to discuss in further detail. Thank you again. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for setting out uh, your policy priorities so clearly. Um, clearly, uh, I think the focus on disabilities care absolutely central here. Maybe we look now um, a little bit at uh, what the private sector can do. Uh, EBRD has been one of the largest, if not the largest, investor in Ukraine for a long time. Um, but as EBRD, we of course also focus on promoting human capital resilience, investing in skills, livelihood, jobs uh, across the sectors that, that we work in. Uh, including, of course, also on digital skills. Mark, can you tell us a little bit about how the EBRD does that um, with our private sector mandate um, and, and, and the way we work in Ukraine? Yes, of course, and, and thank you, thank you, Barbara. And um, just to say, real, real pleasure to be um, here as part of this conversation with the, with the commissioner and with the um, deputy minister. A really important topic for us to be um, discussing. Um, so, so first of all, just a quick word on um, the EBRD's role in Ukraine and the, you know, as you mentioned, Barbara, we have a long-standing relationship, one of our largest countries of operation. Um, we are, we have been one of the largest investors in the, in the country. Um, and since the beginning of the war, we um, decided to step up our support to increase our um, support for Ukraine. Um, actually, we've invested over 3 billion euros um, since the beginning of the war, achieved a target that we set ourselves. And I think playing a, playing a critical role, and I think this goes to what the commissioner was talking about, helping to support the private sector, helping to keep the economy functioning, um, helping uh, Ukraine to survive economically, whether that's work that we've done with state-owned enterprises, um, with Ukraine Ergo, literally helping to keep the lights on, um, or work with the private sector, helping to keep businesses um, work, helping to keep trade um, uh, flowing. Um, in, in terms of human capital and skills, I think I think we're we're all aware of the kind of massive impact that the war has had on um, on human capital of the country. The the very large numbers of people that have been um, displaced, the six million refugees outside the country, the five million um, internally displaced people, um, the significant decrease in late in Ukraine's um, labour force. Um, uh, some estimates a forty percent decrease. Um, big jump in the level of unemployment um, and of course um, something like one and a half million people of working age who've been uh, mobilized as part of the, the war effort um, all of these all of these kind of forces all of these um, uh, significant impacts have had a major you know they present a major challenge to the private sector in terms of um, uh, helping their sectors to continue operating how how in these circumstances you can maintain 
um, a skilled workforce, make sure that you've got the right people doing um, the right jobs? How do you manage these kind of reductions in working capacity? Um, and of course, as, as has been mentioned by the Deputy Minister, how do you um, work to ensure routes back into employment for returning refugees um, or, or, or for veterans? Very, very significant challenges. Um, and just to you know, move on to the EBRD approach, and I think we have a, um, a, a unique and very valuable approach. So we work very actively with our clients. We, we not only provide um, investments, but we will actively work with cl clients to, um, to help them, for example, with their workforce crisis management um, uh, measures, to help them manage these workforce um, issues. We will help them to put in place um, reintegration programs for, for veterans or for people with um, disabilities um, and we will help them in terms of developing uh, the, the correct skills, the competencies and skills that, that are necessary in today's um, labour market. We, we have um, uh, worked with, you know, with some of Ukraine's biggest employers, with Ukrainega, with, with Naftagas, helping them to manage their very significant workforces in these times of acute um, stress um, and we've also worked with um, with SMEs through the work we do with local local banks we um, uh, provide advisory services for, for SMEs to help them adapt to these um, challenges um, beyond that beyond the support we give to clients we're also able to um, leverage the, the relationship we have with key employers in Ukraine the relationship we have with the government um, to engage in some significant and important policy engagement so to um to give you a couple of examples here um we've been working uh with the ministry of education and science on skills policy reforms doing um a, a, an analysis of the skills gaps the skills needed across the economy um and then working to update um key national occupational standards in line with eu standards um and we've been very, working very closely with the um uh, with the ETF um, on this, and we're, we, we very much um, value the relationship we have with ETF, and very much looking forward in a few minutes to, to signing a, a, an MOU on them. Um, we've also been working with the Ministry of Economy on um, how to um, improve the labour market, improve the um, the jobs brokerage system to ensure um, that information is there to um, match people to to vacancies, basically to improve the overall functioning. Um, of um, uh, the the jobs the jobs market these um, I, I think this is the the, the, the the sort of final point that, that I want to um, um, end on these are all critical parts of the emergency response um, in Ukraine I think that there is a um, there is a risk um, sometimes in the debate when you're talking about the very significant challenges that Ukraine is facing the significant challenges in terms of providing Ukraine with the necessary support to think that human capital skills, this is all for the future, this is all for, for, for reconstruction. Actually, investing in people yeah. is a critical part of the current support for Ukraine and a critical part of supporting Ukraine um, to get through this war um, and get to the, um, you know, to, to, to invest in its people now and to, to survive and thrive in the current circumstances. Thank you very much, Mark. And I think the, the, the focus on now, it has to happen now. This is not for tomorrow, this is for today, is, is a really important message. Deputy Minister, maybe if I come back to you, um, how can international partners support you in the reform agenda that you have set out? You've heard from EBRD, we've heard from the Commission, but what can we do to support you in the efforts that you, you undertake, um, particularly when it comes, for example, to technical financial assistance? Thank you. First and foremost, of course, the continued support in terms of budgetary support to ensure that we are able to make the necessary payments and continue the implementation of the existing programs. In addition, technical and financial assistance is very much needed in various areas in terms of the reform agenda. First and foremost, as I mentioned, for the development of social services, whether technical support and the design of the new social services to meet the needs and the specifications in line with EU care standards, at the same time to boost the availability of care services 
for individuals with disabilities for older persons, as this will also have a significant impact on labor force participation to free those caretakers and to enable them to return to the labor market. This of course also includes different models of care delivery. And here we would also appreciate and require technical and financial assistance to develop the proper models for either assisted living facilities for individuals with disabilities or older persons for those who are not able to live independently and think of new ways and methods of delivering such care. The second aspect is that of education and training of service providers social workers, prosthetists. Um, here it is critical, as I mentioned, in terms of the growing number of individuals with disabilities and the growing needs in terms of prosthetics. Uh, we, we need to uh, ensure that adequate and qual qualified staff are available to deliver these services and uh, to deliver prosthetics. In addition to ensure inclusive recovery, I would highlight the need and investment in the modernization of rehabilitation centers and facilities to ensure that they are able to provide the full range of services to support individuals during the rehabilitation process. This also includes creation of schools for using wheelchairs, for orientation for visually impaired uh, people and other types of educational facilities. Of course, there are also, as Mark mentioned, wide opportunities for private sector investment, particularly in the social services area, where providers can enter as provide private providers can enter as providers of social care services, as well as there are also elements to localize the production of components, for example, for prosthetics and orthopedic products in Ukraine. And of course, we value the support and the technical expertise of our European partners as well in the design of the various reform initiatives from social protection programs to pension reform systems to the de de demographic design strategy and other elements. So it's not just about the financial resources that are needed, but also really the technical know-how to ensure that we apply the good global practices, but also to enable us to leapfrog and really pilot the most innovative reforms that, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Schmidt, if I could come back to you. Um, we've heard about the need, um, we, we heard about the sort of the need to focus on support now, um, but of course there is also the longer term run when we look at pre-accession. Um, where do you see the priorities, including at the policy level, um, to support Ukraine's human capital and skills development uh, in this context, particularly in the light also of the longer term pre-accession route? Well, first, uh, it's absolutely true that what we have to do, we have to do it now. Mm -hmm. It's not something which uh, we can plan now for the future when the war is over. Certainly, it's important also to plan the reconstruction in a midterm perspective. And I hope that this will come as soon as, as possible, but uh, we have to do uh, support now. And uh, you know that there is a discussion on the Ukraine facility is still going on, 50 billion euros. And I, uh, I would really like to, uh, to make some kind of an appeal to those who still uh, have difficulties with that and uh, it takes some time, uh, apparently, uh, before this can be approved, that this is not responsible. And uh, because this is a message, and it's a wrong message to uh, the aggressor. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, we have not to give lessons to other countries, but uh, we have to follow what goes on in other parts of the world, uh, what is done there in, in budgetary terms. And this is also absolutely a wrong message. But that's one aspect. The second one is about, I would really uh, welcome and, and express my full support to this uh, MOU, which is uh, now uh, will be signed between ETF and the uh, EBRD. I think this is also, this is a positive message. This is a, a very good and strong commitment that uh, on the basis of what you are already doing and on the basis of what ETF is doing and can do more, that uh, we have to scale up our support in the specific field of skills, of education, of training uh, to Ukraine. My third point is about the young 
Ukrainian being in the EU. Um, that's a fundamental issue that we have to provide these kids, as to all the kids, by the way, but also to these kids the best possible education. Because the idea of the aggressor is finally to take away a generation of young Ukrainians and to undermine the capacity of this country. So uh, we have to work together with the Ukrainians on uh, giving a good education to the kids. And I know also that the Ukrainian authorities are doing a lot of, are making a lot of efforts, precisely thanks to teleeducation, online education, uh, to give additional possibilities to these kids. My fourth point is about what you have already mentioned. It's about people with disability. It is a tragedy when we are talking about people with disability that every day, every day, this war is producing people with disability. Every day. Young men, mainly young women, but many young men, very healthy, very strong young men, become disabled because of this absurd and criminal war. And um, this is a challenge. I had a very important discussion with the Minister of Social Affairs on how can we help Ukraine uh, to give perspectives to these young persons who, uh, who, have, who are going through a very difficult moment because becoming from one day to another a uh, disabled person is, is psychologically not an easy thing. And uh, you have really to open to these persons a real perspective, also in terms of uh, jobs, in terms of integration into the labor market and in society at large. And uh, I think we have to come back and, and see what, what kinds of things we can do, because precisely here, IT is opening a lot of possibilities where people can first be skilled, and then also become, uh, 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 be integrated into the labor market. So in that sense, I, I would very much uh, encourage uh, uh, this and together with member states to, to see how we can first the health part, but then also the part of reintegration of these persons into the labor market, thanks to the right skills. And here again, uh, skill, uh, digital skills can be uh, of high importance. So I hope, I'm sure that this will be also a subject uh, dealt, in, uh, dealt with uh, by, uh, through the uh, memorandum you, you will sign. So this is, these are the major points. So, and this is preparing enlargement. This is strengthening uh, uh, the resilience of uh, the Ukrainian people, but also the, the uh, Ukrainian society and the Ukrainian economy, because this is fundamental make the society to keep this very high resilience to keep it uh, because uh, there is ob obviously everywhere a, a war fatigue uh, and when you are an open society a free society and ukraine is a free society that's not the case for russia russia is a, a dictatorship is an author authoritarian system where people cannot express themselves ukraine is a free society an open society, well, we have really to help them to keep this resilience and uh, to, to prepare also the perspective. That's the very important political perspective, which is uh, uh, enlargement process and help them in different areas and especially also in skills. And here we are working also on the comparison of um, the skills, the recognition of skills. We, we Two days ago, we adopted the the talent pool, and one element of the talent pool is that we have to facilitate, we have to improve the recognition uh, of uh, third countries, for the time being, Ukraine is a third country, uh, uh, diplomas and, and skill and, 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 uh, and education uh, schemes. So this is an important thing that we, we talk about the same things and we have compared already the schemes which exist in Ukraine and the frameworks and, and, and the frameworks existing in the Union. And this is also an important base to work with the Ukrainians on skills policy 
and uh, we, we, Ukraine joined already also some programs, especially on digital, uh, to associate. And again, I think this is a real cooperation because it's not just uh, uh, on the, the EU side uh, giving things to Ukraine, but we, we, we get also a lot from the Ukrainians precisely on, on digital. And I must say I had the opportunity to be in Ukraine when the commission went there. And uh, I was very much impressed also by the minister who is in charge of uh, digital in the Ukrainian government. This is really a very strong aspect also and, and policy uh, maker in the Ukrainian government. And uh, I think the cooperation in, uh, on that, uh, in that context is extremely, extremely precious. Thank you very much. And clearly, so many areas uh, to, to focus on um, through our partnership uh, between the ETF e EBRD um, Commission, but, but uh, across a whole range of actors uh, from disability to skills um, to the war effort uh, as well, of course. Mark, if I can come back to you, um, there was also a lot about scaling up. You know, what can we do? How can we scale up uh, now um, in the partnership, in partnership with, with the Commission? But what, what what can EBRD do more of? And, and where do you see um, its plans for, for scaling up impact on the ground? So, so um, um, I mean, just, just, just firstly on the partnership point, I think, I think there's enormous potential for, for partnership. And I, I think um, this conversation very clearly demonstrates the alignment of our um, uh, objectives that we all agree on the importance of um, uh, protecting human capital, protecting livelihoods and jobs, doing that now, um, the important focus on on skills, the kind of opportunities in the tech sector, et cetera. So, so a, an enormous degree of alignment between, um, between us, the Commission, um, uh, the work we do with the European Training Foundation and with the um, Ukrainian um, authorities. Um, just a particular word, because I'm sitting ne here next to the Commissioner on our partnership with, with, with the EU. Um, I mean, the EU is obviously not only a very um, important shareholder in the EBRD, but is also a very significant contributor in terms of donor um, funding. And we're incredibly grateful for that, but we're always in the market for, for more donor <laughs> funding because um, the, the important work that we do, um, the, the work that I described in terms of how we support our clients, how we um, do um, policy engagement requires support from, from donors, but we're, we're, we're incredibly great, grateful for the, the very strong partnership that, that we have. Um, looking forward and, and scaling up, um, I think we've, we've covered a lot of the issues through the course of the conversation, um, but obviously we, we, we all hope very much that we will move from the kind of emergency crisis workforce management stage um, to a focus much more on how to boost productivity, how to uh, invest in the kind of the, the skills that will uh, deliver sustainable um, growth for Ukraine, um, the focus on, on economic recovery um, and, and all of those issues. Um, that, that will be the, the, the priority. Um, but of course, also the very kind of specific challenges that, again, we've covered through the course of this conversation. The, um, issues around disability and how to um, uh, reintegrate disabled people back into to the workforce. Um, the, the broader question of how to reintegrate veterans back into the to the workforce. Th these will all be big um, challenges that we will collectively have to um, to work um, uh, together um, on. Um, and and I think also, um, and again, we go back to something that was mentioned earlier: the the issue of how to um, encourage uh, people who have left the country back to the, the country, and that, that's kind of related to the um, to the issue of opportunities and um, uh, skills, opportunities, high quality jobs, and, and investing um, in people. So um, let me let me finish there. But I think just to just to stress the the, the, the critical importance of investing in people um, now and in the future. Thank you very much, Mark. And I see that we have one slider question coming through to the uh, Deputy Minister. Which priorities on labour market and skills would you pick up first um, as a follow-up of the enlargement report? Um, so maybe just give us your one priority in this context, um, very briefly. I think 
for us, certainly within the sphere of the social policy, it's about training the skilled workforce to deliver these social services, social workers, prosthetists, rehabilitation experts, and so on to enable individuals to receive the necessary quality support services. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all three of our speakers. Thank you very much, Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you very much, Mark Bowman. And thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister uh, Postolowska. Thank you very much for your contribution. And we now move on to um, the um, well, the next part of this event, uh, which is the signing of the MOU between the European Training Foundation and the EBRD. Um, as mentioned before, we have been working together for many years already. This is a strong partnership um, that uh, in a way brings together two elements, the solid policy expertise of the European Training Foundation with the reach into the labour market, particularly the private sector of the EBRD. And together we can really move the dial and together we can really shape effective policy solutions. And today we are going to do more of that or start the, the process towards doing more of that and deepening and strengthening our um, cooperation in this context. So I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Pilvi Torsti, um, who's the director of the European Training Foundation, onto the stage. Um, welcome, Pilvi, and to sign the MOU together with Mark Bowman. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And as you already asked for more, so I think it's appropriate that the commissioner... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm <laughs> where, where, where do we sign? So let's see if you find our names. Okay, here we go. So it's like a marriage. You, you need some... Uh... <laughs> You're the witness. You will enhance the cooperation between our two organizations, particularly in relation to the response to large um, scale shocks and crises uh, in Ukraine and also in other parts of our regions and with a specific focus on digital skills and green skills. So all very, very important areas and very excited to work together even more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome back, um, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for staying with us uh, for the next part of our uh, event today. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our second panel here. Um, and we will, of course, discuss and delve further and deeper into some of the questions and the key points uh, that were raised earlier on. Let me welcome Marlene Marston, who's the Deputy Director of the Ukraine Services at the European Commission and also Head of Unit of Economic and Sectoral Policies. Welcome, Marlene. Very good to, to have you here. Uh, welcome also Vasile Tofan, who's the Senior Partner at Horizon Capital Ukraine, one of the leading private equity firms in emerging Europe and also a very valued client of EV. BRD, welcome. Uh, Pilvi Torsti, um, Dr. Pilvi Torsti, we have already uh, met you earlier on for the signing, so fantastic to have you here on the panel. And I'm also delighted that we are joined by Andrei Remizov, who should be on the screen, and there he is, um, who's the director of the Entrepreneurship and Export Promotion Office in Ukraine. So a very, very impressive panel uh, and lineup. So we have heard a lot about the challenges in relation to human capital in Ukraine, uh, but also the central importance of investing in skills and people um, at this time uh, for the war effort now, uh, but also in the longer term. Uh, Marlene Martin, maybe if I come to you first. Um, the enlargement package of the European Commission's assessment of Ukraine's progress uh, on its European path has um, just come out. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about where do you see uh, Ukraine actually performing very well um, and where do you think there is further need um, to, to focus support and, and, and assistance in this context? Oh, thank you very much uh, and a pleasure to be here today, especially after such a, a very good debate at the first uh, panel here. Um, I've just returned from uh, Kiev uh, on my seventh mission in four months. So the Ukraine service is doing its utmost both to help in, in the, the process preparing for, for this enlargement report we came with last week, but also in, in, in all the support to, to ensure the path going forward. 
Um, what I, I just want to pause for a second to, to really uh, remind everyone of what a historical moment it was Wednesday last week when the Commission uh, recommended um, opening up accession talks uh, with Ukraine. We all know what the country has been going through for the last year and a half after the full-scale uh, war of aggression, but certainly also since all the reform efforts that's been going on for for a longer time since already with the accession agree, uh, association agreement. And what we've seen and what is also reflected in the enlargement report that we came with last week is the impressive amount of reforms that the country has carried out. Now the enlargement report uh, that we came with, the country report, also shows and identifies, it gives a snapshot of the entire country, you could say, the economy and the social structure and infrastructure. So it gives a snapshot of all areas of how performance uh, is perceived and where there is recommendations for, for further progress. Now, I could, I could speak for, for a long, long time on, on all the various chapters, but if just to say in, in brief, to, to, to reply to your question, uh, in general, uh, we've seen a lot of progress uh, also in the area of rule of law, which was the first important area to uh, see uh, uh, improvement in order to come to this historical decision last week. We have seen progress in almost all of the seven agreed areas with the Ukrainian authorities and identified a few areas where more efforts are needed. However, the progress has been so impressive that we do recommend uh, opening up the accession talks. Now, the report itself is then, as I said, giving a snapshot. So for each area of the society and the economy. It shows the, the areas that we think the government should prioritize for the next year. And in that sense, the whole enlargement proce process, you could say, is also a key to try to prioritize and, and sequence the efforts needed. But in, in areas where we've seen that the country is doing really, really well, you, you could mention the, the digital transformation as one of the key areas. And this is an area where actually they're performing much better than many member states and could become a very good um, example for many uh, of the other countries uh, in, in their further integration with Europe and hopefully in future also with them being part, full, full part of the European family. Certainly there are also areas where uh, further efforts are needed. One area is uh, in, in the uh, labor market and employment. So here we have uh, assess them as having what we would call early, early stage of preparation. Uh, and we have identified a few key uh, challenges that needs to be tackled uh, to, to see further progress. And this is what the report, the pro, uh, this report uh, helped them to, to, to move forward with. Uh, one of the big issues that we've been discussing a lot with the Ukrainian is also, and also with the, with the deputy ministers and the others involved, is also the, the, the huge informal economy. And here it's certainly also very much an issue that there is a very, very high uh, share of undeclared work, um, which is not uh, one, one thing is, of course, the current situation, but it was also the case before uh, uh, the full-scale uh, aggression of war. So almost one in five of all employed workers uh, are, are in the informal employment uh, before the war. Uh, and the labor relations uh, are also guided by an overarching labor code, which is from the 1971. So this is an area where we have asked them to, to try to look into, to see further alignment with the UAK in this area. Now we've also uh, worked with them on how they can uh, adopt new fr uh, framework for in the field of labor relations and occupational health and safety uh, to bring in line also here with the EU key. The social dialogue has, has a crucial role to play and is also a, an element that we've discussed with them a lot. But besides, and I think the previous panel showed this very clearly as well, so besides these areas, what is absolutely key for Ukraine going forward and for getting both the economy and the society back to be uh, as resilient and as, as strong as their spirit at the moment is showing, uh, they also need to focus very much on skills. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not an area where we have a, as much EU key as in other areas, but it's an area where we're working very closely with them to identify key areas for, for improvement. 
So uh, our assessment is that Ukraine is broadly aligned with EU policy and when it comes to training and qualifications. But one area where we think they, they, they really uh, would benefit from focusing is, is especially on when it comes to uh, the VET, so the vocational educational training system. This is also an area that could help them tremendously in the whole reconstruction effort of the country where there will be different skills need needed, but there will also be, as also mentioned in the previous panel, needs from uh, a lot of people who have seen their lives turned upside down and need to get a new future, uh, pros prospects of again being a, a fully part of society even if they have been traumatized physically or, or mentally by, by this, this horrible situation that they're going through at the moment. So in order to reintegrate them into to society and also to the labor force, that would be a, a really, really strong asset to focus on. So this is one of the key areas. Um, as, as I mentioned, I could talk for a very long time on, on these areas, but just to, to, to end on the digital so while they have already shown to be incredibly strong in this area and they have a very, very um, well-functioning uh, IT sector that's also from the whole, both from providing jobs, but also from keeping the economy going here during the, the attacks, the digital sector has not just been very creative industries, but it's also been much more mobile. So when there has been attack in some areas, the digital sector and the employees have been able to move to safer areas without should we say disruption also to this part? So this is an area that's been functioning very well, but where they could also focus on further strengthening both uh, the, 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 the employments, but also the, um, the, the education system in this area to, to further strengthen. But they are in a good point in this area. Th those would be the, th the three key areas I would mention here in my first. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, very interesting to hear at the sort of very, very strong progress, uh, particularly in the digital side. Um, but of course, also a uh, continuing need to focus on areas such as TVET uh, and, and skills and labor market uh, reforms more broadly. Um, maybe Pilvi, if I can come to you next. Um, clearly, the focus on skills is very important and is, is critical, but the need for different types of skills is changing uh, due to the war and also if you look at the longer term um, hopefully recovery and reconstruction efforts. Where do you see the skills gaps sort of now and as they are sort of developing uh, further and, and what, what would need to be done to, to tackle those? Thank you, uh, Barbara. First of all, I have to apologize. I think I have a very strange microphone, so let us hope it uh, stays on, in, in place. But um, to answer your question, let me just give the context of the European Training Foundation that has been mentioned a few times here, so where, in a way, my judgment and my uh, evaluation comes from. Uh, ETF works uh, in, with, uh, as an EU agency on the human capital development, so training and education policies in countries outside the Union, in particular in the enlargement, uh, but also uh, uh, elsewhere. And that, of course, brings us uh, to Ukraine being really the core uh, of our work, including the other enlargement countries currently. And we work with the three core services. So it's monitoring and, and analysis of systems here, recent uh, Torino process system analysis of what is happening in Ukraine, in, in particular in the sector of vocational education and training, digitalization, green. Then we do skills foresight, so try to match these two, um, yeah, monitoring and, and, and analysis, and then foresight in order to do policy advice on the European family, so with the Commission working with Marlene with the Ukraine plan, but it, of course very importantly working with countries. And so with Ukraine, ETF has the history of 30 years, 3-0, and that has been very important because what's in, now in these years of the horrible war it has allowed us to work on three levels and the immediate uh, response on the enlargement and I would share the view historical here of the news and on the reconstruction and look with all these three dimensions all the time the elements of labor market skills education. So coming then to your question, I, I think uh, it's easy to package here with the great uh, previous speakers from the from the uh, from uh, commissioner and from the uh, vice president and from the vice minister and from Marlene, who all have of course stressed the situation where we are. So we cannot forget when we start talking about skills gaps that we have a situation of, of pre-war, where for instance the employment rate was actually going down. So that trend was there and needs to be tackled still. 
we have about 11 million people either internally or externally displaced mm -hmm. and we have the challenge of focusing currently to the future at the war economy situation and finally we have the question of social fairness inclusion disability so enormous issues all of these for any country and in this particular case for ukraine so therefore it's 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 great that we can then talk about the skills gaps and in particular digitalization that was being now uh, at, at our focus because there i think both when we look at the what was there before and what's there currently it's quite positive news as has been said so uh, we were looking at, for instance, ETF is following online job vacancies in Ukraine since 2020. And there we hardly see actually vacancies where you wouldn't need at least some level mm. of quite advanced skills. Uh, so it means the skills gap is there. But on the other hand, it means that the sort of employers, both private and public, are on a level of requiring such skills, which is, of course, good news for the economy. So in other words, the transformation was there and it's been only going stronger, it seems, during the war. Uh, I think we all have shared our uh, impressive, I, we can all share our sort of impressive remarks of the Minister Fedotov in his, in his efforts really over these, these years. We checked the statistics at ETF and in the just the 20 to 21, the IT sector made 36% increase plus and it's about 4% of the GDP, so it's, it's not insignificant. So that means that the skills needs there also are really the needs of the society. So finally, Papara, for this question um, uh, uh, on where the gaps, or how sort of large are the gaps, I think we can conclude by saying that both the uh, enterprises and the private sector that we'll, we'll hear in a minute and the public sector actually have set the scene so in the public sector, you have, for instance, for procurement, great already, Prozorro, I think it's called, platform, or several digital sort of services available. Mm -hmm. So you need skilled people and skilled professionals to take those further. And the same goes actually uh, with, with companies. And that's, of course, where such tools as the European Digital Compass, for instance, provide us a tool to analyze what, where we have the skills needs, but also infrastructural, public sector, uh, uh, and, and, and on the level of enterprises. So I stop here just saying that I do think we have the tools, and I think we also have a very good level at the moment of understanding with Ukrainians about the way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pilvi. And sort of picking up on, on your point about tools um, and, and the importance of partnership and particularly working between um, the public sector on the policy side but also the private sector. That brings me to, to Andre. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about where do you see this cooperation between the public and the private sector, particularly at the policy level? Um, we all want to try and create a, a, an, an effective ecosystem in, in which skills can develop and, and livelihoods are protected and, and so forth. But, but how can we actually do that? Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here online with you today, colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, first of all, I want to represent myself uh, and uh, I represent the state institution under the cabinet of Minister of Ukraine, uh, which at the national level is responsible for the implementation of the state policy for the development of entrepreneurship and uh, the promotion of Ukrainian exports. And we create uh, various opportunities and digital services for the development of uh, entrepreneurial skills. And uh, together with the Ministry of Digital Transformation, we are developing the DA Business National Project, which is the part of the DA ecosystem. Uh, DA is a digital brand of Ukraine, and uh, I think that I will talk about this project uh, later in detail. And uh, regarding your question, uh, in my opinion, a high quality interaction and uh, ecosystem uh, can be built when the government institutions can take uh, specific actions uh, to support initiatives from the private sector. For example, uh, they can, uh, for example, distribute information about the specific uh, free initiatives for citizens and entrepreneurs to a certain audience, provide support for specific private initiatives from the state budget or the budget of international partners, uh, under the conditions of a transparent competition and selection of such initiatives. And the third one, uh, to invite the private sector to implement specific state initiatives. Uh, first of all, taking uh, into account uh, the Ukrainian context, I would like to give an example of the work of the Ministry of Digital Transformation, our institution, and uh, other ministries. 
Uh, even before the start of the full-scale war, we adopted the philosophy as a basis uh, that we uh, very actively interact uh, with public sectors uh, during the implementation of the state policy and invite companies, private business, to create uh, certain educational products. And uh, we are constantly approached by uh, various companies uh, that want to create certain training programs for citizens and uh, businesses. And we give such uh, organizations the opportunity to share information about themselves. We support them in creating such products and spread the word about it. And in just one year, our institution together with the ministry uh, created about 10 systematic training programs, uh, 100 short-term programs, and about 50, uh, 15 um, different uh, online courses and programs for citizens and entrepreneurs uh, in digital format, together with uh, Ukrainian business, uh, public sector, and international donors. And uh, these programs helped a large number of uh, entrepreneurs and citizens develop their skills. Uh, and I was also given an example of the Ministry of Economy of Ukraine. They created this special program and now uh, 1,000 Ukrainian unemployed and uh, inter internally displaced uh, women will be able to participate in free training programs in IT and creative sector. It's very important. And uh, this became possible also thanks to the synergy of the ministry, uh, the private companies, which will essentially train uh, women uh, uh, in these uh, spheres, uh, thanks to the support of the EU. And uh, EU uh, will help uh, implement this initiative. Um, I think that such initiatives uh, show uh, the importance of synergy between the state, private business and organizations, OVS, as well as uh, international donors. And uh, finally, I want to say that the support of um, human and uh, entrepreneurial capital and uh, an effective, effective ecosystem should also be built on digital government solutions, because it's possible to build uh, partnership with private organizations around digital solutions, uh, distribute some uh, their products and information about these products, create uh, joint training programs, uh, etc. And uh, in general, for the development of human and uh, entrepreneurial capital in Ukraine, I think it's very important to involve international organizations and large uh, educational initiatives. Uh, and therefore, the signing of this memorandum of understanding between the EBRD and the ETF is definitely a positive signal for the further uh, reconstruction of Ukraine and assistance in developing the skills of Ukrainian citizens. Uh, I think that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving us these many examples of um, good cooperation and, and, and in a way platforms bringing together the public and the private sector to, to achieve impact. Um, talking about the private sector, um, maybe Vasily, if I come to you, uh, Horizon Capital is one of the longest established and leading fund managers in Ukraine and Moldova. Uh, you've invested in 160 companies over, over time, um, and you employ 77,000 people across the region, so clearly a huge, hugely important player. Um, and earlier on when we spoke, you said that your investments primarily focus on, on the digital industry now. So this is where people count. This is where skills are important. Uh, this is very much a human capital driven, driven uh, um, sector. So what does, what, where do you see the prospects for this sector, particularly in relation to the workforce? You know, where, where are the opportunities? Uh, what is the outlook for, for that sector uh, in terms of creating high value added jobs uh, within Ukraine? Thank you, Barbara, for the opportunity to speak here. I have to say uh, that uh, I probably, as a technology investor, I probably am about to lose my entire credibility given the fact that I wear a tie. I'll just say that was a humble attempt to fit in to this honorable <laughs> audience. Um, indeed, it's um, um, we invest primarily in IT, and maybe today in these uh, dark times, maybe for, for for the world, and very challenging times for for for, for Ukraine with all the all that is happening. Maybe I'll. I'll also show an optimistic take on things and also speak about the, the positive things on, on the ground and the things that keep us actually motivated and optimistic about the future. Uh, indeed, IT has been a phenomenal success story for, for Ukraine. I'll just give you two numbers. In 2003, 20 years ago, it was a $100 million export industry, just above $100 million. Last year, in 2022, 
this uh, industry reached eight billion dollars so phenomenal phenomenal growth and last year despite the full scale invasion despite the fact that uh, uh, a lot of productivity has been lost for a month people were migrating you know, from east from kiev to the to the west even despite all that the sector has grown eight percent at the moment it brings about 12 uh, percent of all uh, exports to ukraine and you understand with the challenges, with the ports uh, blockade, uh, blo uh, blockaded, blockade, um, with the challenges on the agri exports and metals and mining exports, which, which are the, have been traditionally the top two in uh, exporting industries to Ukraine, or of Ukraine, IT is the lifeline, the foreign exchange lifeline for the country, the one that still brings, um, uh, uh, say, euros and dollars to, to the country at a time when it needs, needs it most. Um, um, and uh, it's a source of well-paid jobs. Yes, the average salary in Ukraine at the moment is very low. It's about three hundred fifty fifty dollars per month, and um, um, in IT sector on, uh, on the other side, uh, on the other side, uh, these jobs are, are well paid. Uh, the average salary is two thousand six hundred dollars, and about uh, more than same, uh, seven times the, the the average salary. And I realize I have to switch to euros, by the way, because I think that's uh, that's uh, the, the 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 right the, the right currency to focus on. In terms of the developments we've seen over the last, say, um, 18 months since the full-scale invasion, first, I think it's the theme of resilience. So the businesses learn to, to adapt. And um, this is from, you know, employing starlings and putting generators and uh, learning how to fit your workflows with the constant sirens and so on. So I think the, the businesses have adapted, IT businesses as well. Even my kids know, you know, that uh, a Shahed is flying, the Iranian drone, they know the, the speed at 350 kilometers per hour. It just went from Kursk. They probably can calculate the time it will make it to Kiev. So you see, it's basically everybody adapted, the kids adapted. So that's a reality of our day. The second, I, the second, I think, uh, important uh, theme that I would underline is still the tremendous support also at private sector level. For example, we, we have um, several IT uh, service companies. The, the customers in the West from US and Western Europe have um, continued working with Ukraine. Some of them have increased the budgets, you know, so the corporate social responsibility, we've seen it at work. Many of them saw in that a way, you know, to get a motivated, you know, hardworking engineer from Ukraine. Uh, to work for them, but also help the country in that way. Third, I, I, I would say a theme, you know, actually we've seen a boost in uh, in digital uh, and shift to digital uh, of the workforce simply because there were fewer jobs in, in, other, in other sectors. Um, for example, um, the business of coding schools has, has boomed. So, right, um, so the formal, say, computer science education would take four years, but you have lots of high quality uh, uh, private programs in Ukraine, for example, a boot camp that in four months can train you into a solid QA engineer or say junior Java engineer. And the business of these bo businesses has, uh, has boomed. Some of them have seen increase in sales over, over, three, time, over three times. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, last thing, maybe I'll mention it. We, we were, we've seen a higher participation of women in the IT sector. That has been a long-term trend. So I, I checked the data actually. In 2011, there were about seven percent of all IT workforce was uh, was, um, was um, um, women. And now the latest data as of 2022, it's 30 percent of the IT workforce is women. So you see, women are picking more of the uh, let's call it a typically. Uh, male job. So overall, I have to say I'm quite enthusiastic and, and positive about about uh, about the prospect of the IT sector. Of course, we need your support. We need EU Commission support, EU Member State support, and I think it transpired very powerfully in your in your speech, uh, Commissioner Schmidt, today. And we need more more of that, more ambassadors like you. And but I think if we'll continue having that support, and of course the very important support of EBRG, I think will win this war, and IT will be even more successful. Thank you very much. And I have to say, this is a very powerful message to hear a positive take and, and to, to actually see the opportunities, for example, in relation to gender equality, uh, but also the, the, the astonishing adaptability, your example about children calculating the time it takes for a missile to maybe hit and the time they have to still to, to play before that becomes something to consider. So uh, so thank you very much for, for, for these examples. Um, maybe Malena, if I come back to you, um, We've heard a lot about the opportunities, particularly in the IT sectors and the booming of, of the coding schools, etc. Clearly for people who are not where they used to live, internally displaced refugees potentially coming back, these are huge opportunities. Where do you see um, 
uh, the sort of the longer term skills um, policies that can really help the integration of people and, and, and drive this, um, these opportunities that we've heard about? Well, um, first of all, I just want to also one other aspect I think is important in all of this is also just the, the, the resilience. We talk about the resilience uh, of, of the Ukrainians when it comes to the aggression, but also the resilience of the economy has been quite spectacular. Mm -hmm. We came out with a, an economic forca forecast earlier this week, also showing uh, really the resilience of the economy as well. But certainly, in order for the economy to really get back on its feet, it, it, it's need, it needs the people. A country is, only, uh, is, is first and foremost made up of the people. And if you want to have investment in a country, you want to also first and foremost invest in the people. Uh, that, is, that is the only way to, to secure, secure the future. Um, when it comes to identifying areas of, of skills needs or, 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 or what, what could be helping the labor force, we have, we have had a lot of discussions also with the deputy minister. I, I saw her Tuesday this week also in, in, in Kiev. We've had a lot of discussions on how, how best to support from an EU side of, of matters. And, and I think besides the enlargement uh, vehicle that I was just uh, discussing earlier. We, we, we certainly also have what Pilri mentioned, the Ukraine plan. So we, we came forward in, in June with the proposal for a Ukraine facility of, of um, 50 billion for supporting the Ukraine. First and foremost, the, the largest part of this is, is budget support. And in this budget support, the, the main vehicle is the, this so-called Ukraine plan. And in the Ukrainian authorities have set up a core group exactly to ensure that everything we're going to do going forward is a whole, not just the whole of government, but it's taking the whole of the society into to, to consideration. And one of the very, very big parts of this is actually uh, everything linked to the, the, the human dimension, you can say, and the, the social aspects. And I think um, in, in these discussions, we have worked very much with, with with uh, all our partners, but certainly also Pilvi, in, in trying to identify areas where uh, you can support. But from the EU side of matters, of course, we're listening very much to, 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 to the Deputy Minister and all the, 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 the civil society players in Ukraine. So we're making sure when we're discussing skills needs going forward that we are involving all partners on the ground. Uh, and we are also encouraging the government to do that. As mentioned earlier, then one of the areas we're trying to we're trying to not jump ahead and become too ambitious. Mm -hmm. To be to 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 be quite honest, I mean there is a limit to capacity of the capacity to carry out reforms, but also to absorb the investments. So what we want to do is to help the Ukrainian authorities to be very uh, focused, strategic, and sequenced in what they're going to do in the short to medium term. And one of the key areas we have identified is, as I mentioned earlier, very much the vocational educational system, in particular because of the skills needs going forward in future. Of course, also the digital skills needs, very much so. So we're working closely with, with the authorities in these areas. But, but we are doing it through this way of having uh, in the plan, as I mentioned, these various chapters of where could be the key reforms, key investments that can really help the Ukrainian uh, economy and uh, society to get fully back on, back on its feet again. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm very you know, encouraged by what I, what I see there when, when, when I'm um, having the, the talks with them, because of course it's all still at an informal level, I will have to, to, to quickly say that, uh, because the Ukraine facility has not yet um, been, it's a proposal from the European Commission. We are hoping very much uh, that the, the member states, uh, the parliament has adopted their position. We're hoping very much that the member states will also very soon start uh, the negotiations so we can have, hopefully, uh, that it can be adopted and enter into force. Because without that, we don't have any uh, support for Ukraine for next year. So we are really reliant on uh, entirely on, on member states uh, coming to, to but, but certainly we're working very closely. I didn't entirely answer your question, but I just wanted to put it in, a big, in the bigger picture of, of, of the work that we are doing on the Ukraine plan. 
So, yeah. Thank you very much. And I think, Pilvi, you wanted to, to come in. Uh, two direct comments. Uh, first one on the vocational education or technical and vocational education and training. Uh, one vehicle that I think has proven to be extremely useful and in particular, and also now in the Ukrainian context, is something that the Commission has supported for a year, few years and worked together with the European Training Foundation, which is the Centers of Vocational Excellence. We have currently about 300 uh, uh, centers across the world and 26 of them are in Ukraine. So almost 10%. Uh, 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 and. What I, why I think they are very important is not only that they target really the excellent vo excellence in vocational education, by excellence here we really mean the sort of high level, high standards, but also inclusivity, the, the inclusion, and uh, working together with the government. And we've seen it in, in Ukraine, the sort of uh, innovation that happens through those centers and really supports then the sort of government's efforts in the curricular and et cetera development. And the, I, I, when you, here, a pro word project, it's always, you know, sometimes it rings bell also that what is then long term and impact. And I think these covers are very important in that sense that they are really long term uh, uh, um, centers that are there, and through them, various innovations uh, in vocational education and technical education can really take root. And moreover, they keep Ukrainians as part of the global network. So I think there is always a danger that a country that has this. A horrible situation that we all feel lots of solidarity and want to support, but it shouldn't become a laboratory, but it should, it should be part of the all sorts of developments that happen everywhere. And as we all the time hear, there is a lot to learn. So these kind of networks also provide that type of platform for practitioners who do their day-to-day -day work with their both adult and young learners with the enterprises together in different regions, because we should also, of course, remember that the regions are very different across Ukraine. And then to the plan, so when I used the word plan, I actually thought about, we, when we heard at ETF that there is the EU uh, important support for the Ukraine plan, we also thought that we need to put our efforts together and have a comprehensive plan for Ukraine and a task force to support all the efforts. So I didn't want to uh, open the big discussion, but I think it was great you opened it here in the panel as well. Thank you, thank you very much for, for adding to that. Um, I think we talk a lot about tools and, we, you know, you have the, the, the centers, um, we, we looked at a number of policy tools. Um, we have talked a lot about digitalization, but in a way we haven't yet so much looked at digital tools. And Andre here, I would like to come back to you. How can we use in a way digital technology to also facilitate that process beyond looking at digital jobs and skills um, in, in the economy, but, but to, to sort of Grease the wheels, if you want, of, of this um, skills um, development process. Uh, thank you very much for your question. So, uh, first of all, uh, I want to say that in Ukraine, the main uh, uh, driver of the uh, creating digital solutions is the Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine. And this ministry created uh, the the uh, ecosystem in 2019, as, as I mentioned before, this is the digital brand uh, of Ukraine. And the Ukrainian government aims to digitize 100% uh, of the most uh, important public services. And uh, DIA app is a unique IT product because currently uh, this product used by uh, 19.7 million uh, Ukrainians. And uh, the ecosystem includes a number of uh, different sub-projects. For example, the education. This is the national edutainment platform for reskilling and digital literacy for citizens. And the business. This is the national project for entrepreneurship development and export promotion. I am not a representative of the ministry, but uh, our institution is responsible for the the business project. And I want to give some context about these two digital solutions for you. And uh, first of all, what we talk about uh, DA education and uh, DA education is the next stage uh, of the evolution uh, of the DA digital education project, which was launched uh, in 2020 and focused on the digital skills and digital literacy. And uh, almost 2 million Ukrainians are registered uh, on this platform. And about 75% uh, of users have watched uh, all of the uh, educational uh, series, uh, courses, and received some uh, certificates. And main goals of this platform is uh, uh, our uh, increased digital literacy level 
in general uh, the second one with skilling up skilling uh, especially for idps uh, person because now we have approximately more than 70 7 uh, million uh, idps uh, person and uh, approximately 5 million of them uh, have lost their jobs uh, unfortunately and uh, the education will allow IDPs, people who have lost uh, their jobs uh, and all the citizens to obtain relevant knowledge and skills uh, free of charge to make uh, a step towards a new profession. And um, if you're talking about functionality of this platform, you, on this platform, users can choose their own personal learning trajectory and study the topics that are most relevant and interesting for them. And uh, also the engagement, uh, edutainment format and micro learning modules with uh, mandatory stop lessons. Uh, they are aim aimed at keeping in the interested, uh, interest of the learner. And uh, uh, the next function is for those who have not yet uh, made up their minds. A career guidance test is available and uh, based on the user's answers. They will receive recommendations uh, on educational content and the list of relevant vacancies. And also we have educational series on reskilling and upskilling. Uh, the, ma uh, the major goal is to improve uh, individuals uh, with the digital literacy skills, uh, while also uh, tackling the critical issues of high un unemployment. And also we have on this platform the topics of the educational series and, uh, and uh, for example, from data analyst to barista, from targeting specialist to baker, from software tester to, to other types of professions. And priority is uh, to give uh, uh, some information about specific professions and users can also watch uh, educational series on digital literacy or cybersecurity on other topics. And also we have the simulators. This is the innovative educational, educational methodology for experience uh, of the different professions. Uh, and people can uh, like learn information about uh, professions in real life or use the case studies. And uh, finally, I want to add that the second uh, solution is the DA business project. This is the project for entrepreneurs, and we have the special uh, one-stop shop for, for, for them, and also the physical infrastructure. Uh, this is the DA business support centers in regions. And uh, as part of this project, we have this na special national school for entrepreneurs, and they can uh, regularly learn some information about how to open business, how to grow their uh, own business, how to develop sales, management, or other topics. And uh, this is the like a very useful platform. And uh, I want to say that we see a huge positive effect from the creation of these two digital solutions, two digital projects. And for three years of this work, uh, uh, portals and uh, offline infrastructure have been used by millions of Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian citizens and entrepreneurs. Most of them improved their skills in uh, various fields. And uh, all, the, all the results became uh, thanks to the support of European Union and all of the international partners who support Ukraine. I, I want to thank you very much for your support. And uh, therefore, I'm sure that... Uh, uh, it is the development of digital uh, ecosystem in combination with uh, offline infrastructure uh, that makes it possible to achieve great results in the development of human and uh, entrepreneurial capital in general. And uh, I think this is the best practice also for some EU countries and uh, we can share this uh, like experience and we are open to cooperation for different countries and uh, sharing these uh, solutions also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. And I think that's a very nice example of how technology can actually facilitate that, that skills process. Fantastic. Now, we've heard a lot about good things about technology, the opportunities that technology can, can, can open up, tech sector, etc. But of course, artificial intelligence uh, can bring a lot of positives, but can also have uh, an, or create a number of challenges. Um, we heard earlier about the coding schools. Um, but there are some estimates that in five years nobody will need to go to coding school anymore because those jobs will be done by artificial intelligence. Uh, now, uh, Vasily, if I can come back to you, 
Where do you see the, the potential threat from, from AI for the future longer term development uh, of Ukraine, particularly because its reliance on the IT and tech sector is so high at the moment? Yes, indeed, Barbara. I think that's an intellectually extremely stimulating question. Everybody is talking about this. I, I'm, I'm coming from Lisbon at the Web Summit, the largest uh, uh, tech conference in, in the world, 70,000 people, and clearly AI was the, the topic of the day. You know, you have AI for pets, AI for plants, AI for everything. So clearly we are the, the, the top of the inflated expectations on this technology. And um, the, I think the... Um, the, in your question, you, you had this uh, uh, provocative statement which comes from the CEO of Stability AI. You did a very respected person in the community who said that five years from now, there will be no software engineers left. And when you think about this, indeed, that's extremely frightening. So are we all going to remain without jobs? Or what are we going to do? And again, I, uh, I will share a humble opinion, which very likely might not be true, but based on, say, a lot of thinking, a lot of reading, talking to people more intelligent than me, I am still an optimist when it comes to AI. I think it will broaden the market, not shrink in it. And let me explain you why I, why I think so. So um, first, um, if we make some parallels with other big technology shifts in the, in, in the past, for example, the, the, the emergence of cloud. So in 2006, when cloud appeared as a, con as a concept, everybody said that, look, okay, cloud will change everything. You know, there's going to be uh, much fewer engineers left. Well, the result is that actually cloud just helped expand the market uh, dr dramatically. And if anything, we have 800,000 in software engineers shortage in European Union. So if anything, it expanded the market. Maybe cloud is too technical, but let's speak about something that is much simpler to understand. Say, appearance of calculator. It didn't uh, render uh, not necessarily the mathematicians. Or uh, the, the, the launch of Excel, you know, uh, in uh, about 30 years, uh, 30 years ago, actually more than 30 years ago, I think it was late 80s. So people were saying when Excel was launched that there will be no, ma no more bankers. Well, surprise, surprise, there's more bankers than ever now, you know, and actually that's also confirmed by the, by the employment statistics. You know, we still, we still have uh, bankers, actuarians, and financial consultants, and so on. And if anything, there, there's more of them given the appearance of Excel. Now, um, uh, what this means for countries like Ukraine Again, I'm cautiously optimistic there. One is, I think, in, uh, from AI, um, uh, the countries that will benefit more is the ones that have their data structured and have easy consumer interfaces. Now, Andre spoke about DIA. Indeed, in order to produce DIA, you kind of imagine what a back-end work you have to do to structure all your public data. And DIA is truly probably the, the best government app in the world. So I think in that sense, AI... Um, Ukraine is going to be an early adopter of AI also when it comes to government tech, simply because it had done the messy work of structuring the data, and um, in that sense, it has a, an, uh, an increased ability of building this large language model based on the data available. Second, I think um, short term, it will benefit a country like Ukraine simply because, um, you know, at the initial moment, AI is not a level playing field. So the best engineers take advantage more of AI than the average engineers, you know, and the, the truth is Ukraine has some of the best engineers in the world. So for example, Ukraine is not the cheapest, um, say, uh, engineering country. So you, you can find much cheaper in parts of Asia, but Ukraine is always competing on complexity of tasks. And I think in that sense, again, probably Ukraine will be among the early adopters of AI and will be helped by that. Longer term though, uh, uh, AI will democratize, indeed, democratize uh, software engineering, and uh, things will move from, say, uh, coding to what is called prompt engineering, right? So you'll have to learn to prompt the, 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 the tools, and they'll produce the code. That's why I love this phrase by Andrew Karpathy, one of the uh, co-founders of OpenAI, who said that the hottest programming language nowadays is... English, right? So it's not Java, not Python, not C++, it's English. Because uh, good speakers of English will be able to be more precise in their prompting and will produce better code. So that's why, as, as an advice maybe to ETF and people here who dispose of large budgets, you know, investing in English can, can actually accelerate, uh, accelerate things because this will produce better prompt, uh, prompt engineers. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all. Uh, to all of our speakers, I think it's been an absolutely thrilling discussion um, and we, we really touched on a lot of things. Just a few messages I would like to take from this. One of the key messages is 
the focus is on now. We have to act right now. Um, partnership is important, such as the MOU that we've just signed. The, as the Commissioner mentioned, the support is strong, continuing and unwavering for Ukraine. Um, but then also, I really want to end on a note of optimism. And, and, and thank you very much for bringing that in. There are so many opportunities. There are so many strengths that we see in Ukraine. There's so much commitment. So I think that really points to a very good future. Thank you very much. Thank you.